Hi, this is Pastor John welcoming you to our broadcast. Today, we start a new series from 1st and 2nd Thessalonians called Living It Out. We're going to take a close look at the brand new church in Thessalonica and see how Paul guides them in walking daily in this incredible transforming gospel they've experienced. Today's lesson comes from 1st Thessalonians 1, where we ask the question, what kind of church do you want to be? Listen in as we share the five characteristics of the Thessalonian church. <laughs> Good morning, church. It is a wonderful pleasure to have you all here with us today, whether you're in the sanctuary or watching us online live or later on today. My name is John Sellers. I'm one of the deacons here and it's an honor for me to welcome you into the house of God this morning as we come together corporately to worship Him. What a privilege, isn't it? All right, everybody put on your proverbial seatbelts. I've got four, maybe five announcements for you today, but these are so important. How important are they? <laughs> they are so important. All right, and if you're getting the Monday minutes and the Friday forecast, you're way ahead of the, the curve here, but let me highlight some things that are really, really super important for you. All right, movies. Who doesn't like a good movie, right? Uh, Ken doesn't like a good movie. All right. <laughs> if you haven't heard of, announced already, uh, the uh, Sight and Sound folks, if you've ever been to their place in Lancaster, or as my wife says, Lancaster, I don't know why that's different. I heard the bells, different from the bells, the bells. <laughs> I heard the bells by Sight and Sound on December 4th at 4 p.m., 1600 for you military in the crowd. So see the Monday Minutes Friday forecast for any details about that. Secondly, Love to Be Me ministry will meet once again on November 11th, at 6 through 8 p.m. This is a ministry for teens and adults with special needs. Volunteers are always welcome. That is this fr coming Friday, right? You got the day off, so come on over. Next is the coat drive. So donate your unneeded clean coats to our Warmth for the Soul coat drive. And if you're curious where to drop those off, there's bins on the front porch of the townhouse. I'm sure you can find a place for them there. If you're actually in the church, Diane wouldn't care if you put them in her office, right? There. <laughs> <laughs> right there on top of the desk. That'd be great. But not in the lost and found, because then they'll get found, right? And then, finally, very important. Look at the person next to you and say, very important. Very important business meeting for the church coming up on December 7th, a day which shall live in infamy. Wednesday night, 7 p.m., 1900. Thus ends John's portion of the reading of the announcements. Thanks be to God. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I forgot to pray, so do your thing. All right. Our last announcement is our opportunity to serve in a worldwide ministry called Operation Christmas Child. Our campus is the new central county drop-off point for those boxes. You may remember in your spiritual past that if you pack a shoebox, you could bring it to your local drop-off point. Well, that's us now, and you can still just pack a shoebox. It doesn't have to be a fancy box or a plastic box. It can be just a regular shoebox. And I have a, a sign-up station back at the landing. I'm now calling it the landing. I don't know why, but it just seemed fitting, don't you think? I'm still looking for the elevator. Can anyone help me with that? So in the meantime, the landing is where, if you'd like to volunteer, it's the week of a week from tomorrow, the 14th through the 21st of November, and there are a smattering of a couple hours per day that we'll have our site open for people to bring either uh, as a group or as individuals their boxes to be dropped off here and to be processed. So they're not just dropped off, but we process them and make sure that the proper numbers are all done and the accounting is all done. If you'd like to participate with me in that, uh, that starts a week from Monday, and that sign-up station will be there all week, including next Sunday, okay? Operation Christmas Child. It's the Division of Samaritan's Purse. It really is a cool ministry and mission. So before we begin worshiping in music, our God is the God of music and we worship him with music. Let's pray, shall we? Holy One of Israel, we worship you as the one true and only God, triune Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We worship you because you have earned our reverence. 
You have earned our respect. You have earned us, mighty one, as your people. Bring us to a place this morning where we might know you even better than we did yesterday. That in these things we sing and say and do, you would be held most high. And not only would you inhabit our praise, mighty God, but you would lift us to the place you want us to be in service. That you bring to our minds those among us who are in need financially, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. That we would be your hands and feet here in Warrenton and Fauquier County that you would be honored by our thoughts as well as our actions. But mighty God, most of all, our minds and hearts, which are yours, given to us for the purpose of your kingdom, we would be really aware of your presence and your work in us and through us. Bless these announcements and bless our music and this worship this morning for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, for indeed it is in his name we pray, saying together, Amen. Let's sing, shall we? We worship an almighty God. We want this morning to, uh, to stand as David's doing. That's fine. We want to open our hearts, open our thoughts, open our minds, and reflect upon the words of David in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. song to you. 
Power 
sermon today asks the question, what kind of church do we want to be? The Apostle Peter seems to provide a great answer, reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, worship team. We come to our time in the service where we continue worshiping with our offering. And uh, Jimmy and I were talking just before the service, the difference between a want to and a have to. 
all of you are sitting here because you want to. Well, maybe some of the kids are have to, but you, you know what I'm saying, right? You are here because you want to. You want to worship God. And we want to worship God in spirit and in truth in all ways that he's called us to do so. And giving of our tithes and offerings is just one of those things. So this ought to be one of those things we want to do. You know, God says, be in partnership with me with your resources. Not just your money, but your time and your talents. Bring those into the storehouse so that we can do the gospel all across this earth. So let's think about that as we seek God with what we should do with all of our talents. And y'all pray with me, okay? Father, we look to you as one who has asked for our partnership with you. And we look at that as a privilege, Lord, and we want to be in a partnership with you, not because we have to. So, Lord, take what we give, bless it for the furtherance of your kingdom here on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. We are continuing now with catechism. We are on question 51. You know what that means? One more question and we're done forever until the next Sunday, right? Then we start over. That's right. Really excited about these last two. If you remember what Jimmy said last time, it's we had this captain of the ship. I rescue those who are. What a neat analogy to what God does for us, what Jesus' work did for us. And in the same way, let's talk about why he needed to leave this earth to go back to heaven. So let's say the question of what advantage to us is Christ's ascension? And then the answer, Christ is now advocating for us in the presence of his Father and also sends us his Spirit. Romans chapter 8. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. You get the idea of advocacy, right? I was talking to Penelope earlier this morning. She loves history. And she told her sister, hey, we'd really like to take a field trip to the American History Museum. And her teacher said, wow, we can do that. But let me go talk to the principal, right? has now become an advocate, right? Taking from people who are less than powerful, authority, the pulpit mic. There's something with the pulpit mic. Use the pulpit mic. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to use the pulpit mic. Is that more gooder? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the teacher is now an advocate for the students, the power less or less powerful to the powerful who have the answer, who have the resources. Jesus now sits at the right hand of God the Father advocating for us. I mean, what better advocate, right? You know, there might have been a long time ago uh, a job posting for advocate in heaven. And Jesus said, hey, sounds like a plan. Hey, hey, Father, what's it going to cost me? Everything, <laughs> right? Everything. It costs him everything to take now this role as priest, as king, as advocate for us. But what better advocate who understands how we operate and what we need, right? I wouldn't want a different advocate. I don't know about you. And then he also gives us the spirit. Have you ever been in a place where you just don't really know how to pray? You got a lot of guts in here going churn, churn, and it's not Taco Bell, but it's something that is really getting you down and you just don't know the words to say. The Spirit prays with you, prays for you to Jesus and Jesus to the Father, right? That's advocacy, that's intercession, that's what he does for us. He couldn't do it before he was here on earth, right? Walking the earth and sitting next to God is two different places. But because he went to the Father, sent us his spirit, he can advocate for us right at the right hand of God the Father. Amen? Amen. Amen. Welcome back to the pulpit, Pastor John Kavakis. They, him and Kelly are back from vacation. Thank you, John. Wow, applause. I, I should just go home now. <laughs>
hey, um, thank you for your prayers. We were gone a long time. Um, I think God used the time, gave us some clarity of thought on several things. Uh, th- these breaks uh, are just so vitally important to Kelly and I. Uh, we, our heads get cleared. We get a chance to talk. Um, we were floating around on the Caribbean for two and a half weeks, suffering for the gospel. <laughs> I come back, you know, we left. There are leaves on the trees. We come back. They're all on the ground. So somebody might be wondering why it's November and I'm wearing a Hawaiian shirt. I'm just not letting go. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, uh, but thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your consideration. We had an awesome time. The, um, I want to talk to you about Tuesday. Uh, it's an election day in Virginia. Uh, I have the honor and the opportunity of working at the polls. Uh, it's my way of getting involved in the system without having to take a position one place or the other. Uh, but I have been encouraging you for several years. And every time an election comes up, in particular a major election, which we'll have in another two years, uh, people come to me and go, you're not telling us how to vote. We need to know who to vote for. And so my encouragement is always vote with your ballot in one hand and your Bible in the other, and you'll be okay. I mean, if we're voting according to scriptural principles, if we're voting for the candidate that has the closest worldview to us, uh, we should be all right. But don't expect that we're going to get salvation or deliverance out of Washington, D.C., brothers and sisters. It's not coming. It's not coming. So the only salvation and deliverance we have is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So vote, but vote informed. Amen? Amen. I'd like you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, about halfway through the New Testament. This is the beginning of a new series. We're called Living It Out. And while you're finding that, I want to tell you about a pastor's retreat I was invited to. Uh, just outside of Boston about a year and a half ago. Uh, it was an informal greeting, uh, informal meeting we had with um, five pastors from the Eastern District. Uh, we were at a retreat center, beautiful place up in the hills of eastern, western Massachusetts. Um, and we kind of sat around for three days and just talked. There was no agenda. Uh, every now and then somebody would ask a question, we'd kind of launch on it, and we'd, we had bonfires and Uh, throwing axes and all the things guys do when they get together and some of the things they shouldn't do when they get together. I didn't particularly care for throwing the axes. I kept on waiting to get injured, but it was fun. But one of the questions that one of the pastors asked is, what kind of church are you? And we all had to give that a little bit of thought. And uh, I think between the five of us, we came up with decent, decent descriptions of our home churches But after we did that, he turned around and he said, what kind of church do you want to be? That that required some thought. I mean, we're right at the tail end of a pandemic. And throughout the entire pandemic, we've been asking that question, what kind of church are we? Are we an online church? Are we a physical church? Are we, you know, what, what do we do? How do we minister the gospel when... It's so difficult to get out and about and so on and so forth. How do we minister the gospel in the middle of all the tension that we were experiencing? Oh, there's not a pandemic. There is a pandemic. You got to wear a mask. You shouldn't wear a mask. You got to get a vaccine. You shouldn't get a vaccine. I mean, all, I mean, for two years, we've just been in the middle of a lot of debate. And most people don't quite know what to believe about all that. We've got our favorite guys we listen to. <laughs> And we believe them pretty much because they agree with us. But we're not quite sure what's happening. And so as we begin to come back together and we see people gathered around the sanctuary we haven't seen for a while, like Doug and Carolyn. Good to see you guys. (laughs) We need to answer the question, what kind of church do we want WBF to be? Not that we have an opportunity to redefine ourselves, Because I think the basics are there, but what are we going to do as we go forward? What does it look like? So I think this 1 Thessalonians is a good way to ask those questions of ourselves, maybe do a little bit of self-examination. This first sermon in the series is just getting started. See what I did there? Just getting started. 
Let me give you a little bit of background about Thessalonica. First century poet Antipater, you don't have to remember that, <laughs> called Thessalonica the mother of all Macedonia. And he used a word to describe this that was loosely translated metropolis, which means mother city. So when we talk about our metropolises today, we're talking about mother cities. It was situated like so many significant cities in the Old and New Testament on the convergence of several trade routes. It had a gigantic port. It was beautiful. It was navigable. It was sheltered. And it was an extremely prosperous extremely influential city. It was religiously pluralistic, which was how those cities got. I mean, we've seen that in Ephesus and some of the other cities we looked at because there's so many people coming and going out of it. So dominated by the worship of two primary gods, uh, Dionysus, uh, who was the god of, watch this, wine, merrymaking, and insanity. <laughs> The other god was an Egyptian god named Serapsis, the god of resurrection, agriculture, and the underworld. Now, we look at them, we go, oh, how basic they were. What primitive people. But if you stop and take a look at it, it's the same thing that's going on today. Folks in Macedonia, particularly in Thessalonica, were preoccupied with themselves and with worldly indulgences and the things that the world could give them in a false form of spiritualism, a counterfeit spiritualism. Kind of a lot like we are here in the United States, here in Virginia, here in Warrington. Now, it's hard to tell how long Paul was in the city. Some people think just a couple weeks. Some people think maybe six months, maybe that much. But his preaching there was powerful. It had an impact. Acts 17 tells us that there was a, a small, albeit strong church there made up of Greeks, influential women, and, and even some Jews convert. But they, they would be very small, and particularly compared to the people that would gather on worship days at the football stadium, I mean the pagan temples, That happened all week long. Make no mistake, the church at Thessalonica was a minority. Very small percentage of the population. But all their activity angered the Jews of the city. And they rose up against Paul and, and kicked him out of the city, had him sent away. Paul went to Berea, uh, somewhere around 30 miles to the, the southwest of Thessalonica, he was well received there, but some Jews from Thessalonica followed him and made so much trouble for him that they asked him to leave that city as well. Paul then went to Athens. It, he wasn't really taken seriously. If you read that carefully, the, the sermon he does on Mars Hill, they kind of mock him. They go, oh, that's kind of interesting. We'd like to hear more from you sometime. We'll debate these issues. And he ends up in Corinth. What we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he arrived in weakness and fear. His missionary journey to Macedonia seems to have been a failure. It wasn't working. Not quite sure what to do about that. Acts 16 tells us that before he went through Macedonia, Paul wanted to go east, but the Spirit restrained him and sent him west. Paul becomes the first gospel missionary to Europe. But he's thrown out of Philippi. He's thrown out of Thessalonica. He's chased out of Berea, not taken seriously in Athens and even Corinth. Everyone's mad at him. His teaching feels ineffective. And Paul is discouraged. Quite naturally so. He's not seeing the fruit of anything he's doing. But Timothy and Silas arrive in Corinth, and they've got some good news. And this is when Paul writes his letter to the Thessalonians. And in it, we're going to find five characteristics of the church at Thessalonica. We're going to find out that they were an energetic church, verses 1 through 3. 
We'll see that they were an elect church. I know a lot of people don't like that term, but that'll be in verse 4. We'll see an exemplary church, a church that set the example in verses 5 through 7, an evangelistic church in verses 8, and then an expectant church in verses 9 and 10. So let's take a look at this, this energetic church, the first characteristic of this new church in Thessalonica. Paul's not ministering alone. He wants to make it clear. He says, I, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. He's not alone. Uh, Silvanus uh, was sometimes called Silas in the New Testament. He was a well-respected teacher. He had a lot of regard in Jerusalem. He was a prophet. We see that in Acts 15. Timothy, Timothy named in five of Paul's six letters. He's Paul's protege. He's very close to Paul. And both of these men have proven themselves over time. So they're not, they're not brand new to the scene. So he says, I, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Now, Paul does this at the beginning of his letters. He's an encourager. He might have something harsh to say, like, Take a look at 1 Corinthians. The entire book is a corrective. You've got to keep that in mind while you're reading it. But Paul starts out with a note of encouragement. He blesses them with grace and peace because that's what he wants for them. There might be differences. There might not be. But he wants them to experience the grace and peace that comes in knowing Jesus Christ. And he give, gives thanks for them. And then he says this in verse 3. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you've got to remember the environment that this church is immersed in. It's hostile. They don't like this new church. They don't like this new teaching. Paul's gospel, Christ, are denied by the vast majority of the people in the city and the region. All the other gods of the city are worshipped enthusiastically, but this new teaching that warns against anything that would be worshipped other than the one true God would confuse the people, maybe upset some of them. But primarily, it would upset the Roman authorities, whose priority was to maintain peace and collect taxes, maintain their power. And if the authorities would, up, would be upset, then that would upset the Jews. Now, the Jews had a kind of a special dispensation. They were allowed to worship as they saw fit as long as there wasn't any trouble. And the Jews saw Paul out there stirring the pot, preaching about resurrection in a different way than their their idol God understood resurrection. Paul's resurrection was in and through Christ alone. It wasn't only too much for the city to absorb, but it could get everyone in trouble and call the Roman legions down on them. That's why the Jews chased Paul from Thessalonica. Why they were so upset at him. There's no laissez-faire, let it be. Why they continued to pursue him to Berea. Paul was upsetting their apple cart. They had a good thing, and they didn't want anybody messing with it. Nobody interfering with it. The, that little church in Thessalonica was not, only, was not only embracing that teaching, they were spreading it. They were sharing it with anybody who would listen. It wasn't just Thessalonica, the mother city. It was going all through Macedonia. A small group of people having a large impact. They were ambassadors to the city. Now, we've talked about that several times. We're going to talk about it a little bit more. To the city, to all Macedonia, the ambassadors for the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they were energetic at it. They were enthusiastic about it. Energized not just by numbers and rewards. They were small, and they were not well-liked. They were energized by the presence of God, energized by the transformation they were going through and would continue to go through. Energized by the awareness of what they had been charged to do. 
The first characteristic of the church at Thessalonica was they were energetic. They were enthusiastic. Even as their size is diminutive and their message is unpopular, they were excited about it. Second characteristic is they were an elect church. Verse 4 says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Comma. Notice the word brothers here is a Delphoi. In this context, it means men and women. They're not just talking to the men, the whole church. The whole church is chosen. Ekla gain. Sound familiar? Where we get our word for elect from. The whole church is set apart for God's purpose. Paul's not trying to start a debate over free will and sovereign election. He's trying to tell the church that there's something unique about you. God has chosen you. He's setting you apart. He's given you a common cause, given you a charge. He's given you a job to do. So as God's soldiers, as his ambassadors, as his charges, the church is to be not just chosen, but the third characteristic, which is an exemplary church. So there's a comma at the end of verse 4. The thought isn't done. And he goes on in verse 5 to say, because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. So the people saw something unusual in Paul and Silas and Timothy and the people he had with them. That caused him to listen to them when they taught. Because they saw things like integrity and compassion and peace in them. And as a result of that, they began to undergo the changes as well. They began to desire that same transformation that these guys with this new message had. And there's evidence of their transformation. Verse 6, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction and the joy of the Holy Spirit. And the only thing I can say to that is, "Uh uh-oh. What did he just say? Oh, he said, oh, you've been called to this grand mission. Oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to impact the world. It did, didn't it? It's going to change everything. It did, didn't it? But you receive it in joy. Uh, I like that. I want to receive it in joy. Paul says, and affliction. Ah. I, I, I can't connect those dots. Maybe, maybe I don't want to connect those dots. It doesn't make sense in a worldly way. Something, something like receiving that in joy and affliction can only work if there's something deeply spiritual going on. Think about this. Who suffers and doesn't complain? Hard to find in our world today, isn't it? (laughs) Oh, you need to hear about my pain. Oh, this isn't right. Oh, I'm indignant over that. Oh, blah, 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 on and on and on. But these people are happy in this oppression that they're experiencing. That alone, you should be willing to wait a month for to hear. (laughs) Amen? That alone, I've been waiting for a month to come and tell you that you can experience oppression in joy. Why did they do that? Because that's what Paul did. Joy and affliction. Only someone who has undergone an incredible transformation, someone who is experiencing an incredible peace, someone who understands and embraces a sovereign, gracious, merciful, and good God, someone who is willing to put him up on the highest pedestal, make, them the, make him the highest priority of their hearts. Only somebody who's done all those things, someone whose transformation is apparent can say something like that. Somebody whose fondest desire is to put 
the one true God on display in the way that they live their lives. Make them a showcase for joy, even in affliction. And they do all this so that in verse 7, you, the church at Thessalonica, became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. They've done it so much that everybody's watching. And they do it by imitating Christ, living like he did. That's what Paul was doing. Doesn't Paul say in his letter to Ephesians, imitate me as I imitate Christ? He's not saying, just be like me. He's saying, follow me because I'm trying to do my best to be like him. They do it by imitating Christ, existing in a world that is not their home, not their final destination, embracing hardship as if their Father in heaven, listen, embracing hardship as if their Father in heaven knows what they need more than they do. Ah. They adopted their third characteristic of becoming an exemplary church. And once, once God is on display in the church, once God's on display in the lives of the people, that the people around them will see that something's going on, and they want to become a part of it. People will want to hear about it. And understanding that people want to hear about it, this made the Thessalonian church, in their fourth characteristic was they were an evangelistic. Verse 8, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, the small beleaguered church is becoming known for its faith, while the entire community, the entire world around it gave in to idolatry, gave in to anger, drunkenness, debauchery. This church, this church gave in to God, surrendered to him, not just when they met, not just for a little bit of time on Sunday morning, but throughout the entire week, throughout their entire lives. And the people in the region began to notice. Paul says, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. He doesn't even need to expand on this fourth characteristic. Everybody knows they're evangelistic. They're not only living the transformation, brothers and sisters, they are sharing it. They are reaching out. They're ministering the gospel to everybody that will listen. And that's what sets them apart for God's purposes. That's what makes them unique. The world around them notices this, and they begin to listen and see Christ in them and hear about Christ from them. An incredible moment. And once the Thessalonian church begins to express these four characteristics, they quite naturally become the fifth characteristic, which is an expectant church. Verse 9, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. They live in a constant expectation of his return. They wake up. What does that mean? You know, we all know he's coming back. Amen? You believe he's coming back? Raise your hand. If you don't, please come and see me afterwards. I think, I think we have unanimity here. So we get that. He's coming back. But they're living. They're living like he's coming back. They wake up in the morning saying to themselves, you know what? Today might be the day. It might be now. I want to do all I can to live the way I'm supposed to live so that people around me can see because if, if he comes back and they haven't received him, they're going to die and burn. He's going to take me. He's prepared a place for me. He's guaranteed me that he's going to come back and take me there. But what about these people here? It could happen in any moment. You know, we've talked about this before. We, we believe in the imminent return of Christ, right? Only some of us think, oh, no, 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 the temple has to be rebuilt. We've got to do this, we've got to do that, got to find the two prophets. I've read it in a book. Some of us don't really believe he could come back at any time. We know, oh, yeah, he can come back any time, it ain't going to be today because there's things that need to happen. 
God says he's going to come like a thief in the night. When people cry, peace and safety. Not when people go, oh, it's the end of the world, the end of the world. When people say, hey, everything's looking pretty good, bam. We don't know when a thief in the night is coming. Unexpectedly, in the wink of an eye, those who believe in him will be transformed. They're an expectant church. And not only believe that he may come at any moment, they embrace it for all that it is. They're not sounding an alarm. They're not pointing fingers. They're not demanding their rights. They're not living in fear. They're not fighting over issues. They are living in the urgency of knowing that the world around them could burn up at any second. They need to tell people that Jesus died for their sins that all they need to do is believe in him and confess their sins, repent. And they can be spared from what's about to happen. Their job, our job, is to throw a lifeline to those that are headed for the sea of fire and tell them there's a way to be rescued from it. So there's our five characteristics of the church at Thessalonica. They're energetic They were small, they were disregarded, they were opposed, but they were charged up, energized by what they were called to do, energized by the Spirit working among them, setting them apart. And they realized that they were, in spite of their challenges, they were an elect church. They had a job to do. They were chosen by God. He gave them a charge. They were to be his ambassadors, his spokesmen, his ambassadors. Let me, let me give you something to think about. Are we ambassadors? Does Scripture say that? You ever notice ambassadors don't go to war? They don't go out and fight. What do ambassadors do, brothers and sisters? They speak for the king. They speak for their king, for their president. Oh, I don't have a king. For their president, for their leaders. They don't engage in the battle. They're representatives. They live in a land they don't belong in. They're citizens of another land. So they get this, so they are an exemplary church. To do all this well, they have to live like representatives of their king, like ambassadors live like citizens of their king's kingdom, not the kingdom that they're in. Because of that, they're an evangelistic church. They live in such a way and they talk in such a way. They're so, so enthusiastic about their true home that the people that are listening to them want to be there too. All that makes them expectant. They're an expectant church. They know as ambassadors that the king can call them home at any moment. And they, they look forward to that. They look forward to their true home. They look forward to that moment. They long for it. While they wait for it, they understand that it will surely come. That call will surely come. But before they leave, before an ambassador leaves a land he's been called back from. He exercises diplomacy. He campaigns for peace. That's why he's there. He relates to the conditions given for the peace, tells them what the king expects, then encourages those who live in that foreign land to listen, to cooperate, to do what the king says, because he is a powerful and wise king. That's us. He's also able. So that's that's the kind of church that Paul wanted for Thessalonica. And they were walking in that. Paul's down and out. He gets this news. Paul, Paul, there's something going on in Thessalonica. You can see Paul going, oh, what? I'm hurting. I hope you got some news for me because all I'm getting is bad news. And Timothy looks at Paul and goes, they listened. They heard you. 
They're doing it. You all go, they're doing it? They're doing it. That's what Paul wanted for Thessalonica. What do you want for WBF? What kind of church are we going to be? Are we going to embrace those characteristics? You know, some of them, we're doing quite well. We've been inactive for almost two years, brothers and sisters. It's been a rough two years, has it not? Oh, we enjoyed being at home in our pajamas. I like it. Give me a cup of coffee. Let me turn the TV on. And nothing wrong with that. If, if, if you can't do anything else, praise God that God has used his technology to bring teaching into your living room. Praise God for you who are online. But now, now we're starting to drift back together, amen? And we're doing the things that define who Warrington Bible Fellowship is. You know, if, if you're not aware of the Love to Be Me program, you've got to take a look at this. This is something that's absolutely incredible. And it's outreach in its finest form. We're down. We're down at the, the shelter. Uh, that's going well. You know, we did the Warrington Festival. We've got some other things coming up. Do we want to be that kind of church? Do we want to be energized? Enthusiastic? Elect? I mean, are we chosen? Regardless of what you think that means, we are. The fact that you're sitting here today, and some of you are still awake. <laughs> Shows that there's a charge here. We're evangelistic. We're expectant. And we're a church family that Kelly and I have come to appreciate over the last 22 years. I can't think of a better time for us to do communion. Amen? You know, this is not just perfunctory. Uh, I, you know, let, let me just share this. But while I'm standing up here and I still have your attention, we were blessed by the way this pulpit was filled while we were gone. I, I, I mean, you know, Zach did the first sermon. Jimmy did the second one. Zach did the third and fourth ones. And we had Dr. Champion. Um, I've got a lot of respect for Zach. He's a young preacher who's got incredible potential and loves the Word of God. And we're blessed to be able to have a relationship with him and his church. But we're blessed to have folks like Jimmy. We're blessed to be in association with somebody like Dr. Champion and with Andre and his, his family. See, we're, we're not just reaching out. God's sending people. It's an amazing time. And we, we, we get to do it together. We get to do it together. See, this is what communion is about. It's not just perfunctory. It's a recognition of the many blessings that God has given us. It's a recognition that God is forming a body. He's not done. He's knitting our hearts together. He's moving us in in one direction. Sometimes we're not quite sure what that direction is, but we know that he's moving us. Amen? It's something that we do as a corporate entity that has its focus on Jesus Christ and knows that the only reason that that can ever happen is because he's done something incredible. He's made a sacrifice that allows us these few moments of quietness before him together to recognize that he's king of kings and lord of lords. So we're going to we're going to pass out the elements. We're going to take the bread. Uh, we'll pass it out, and then we'll take it together, and then we'll take the juice, and we'll, we'll take that together. If I could call the deacons forward, please. All right. The deacons and our servants. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's been a few, for, uh, a few minutes before the Lord. Um, ask him to examine you. Ask him if there's anything that you need to render up to him before we take this together. But just spend a few moments in quiet 
appreciation of the incredible sacrifice that was made so that we could have these moments together. So when Jesus is in that smoky, hot room, and he holds up this bread, and he says, this is my body, which is broken to you, for you. He wants him to watch carefully what's about to happen, because his body is about to be broken. It's going to be pierced. But that's not the whole story. His body is broken, And then raised again, raised again so that in him a new body will be formed. That's us. That's us. And when we we take and eat this morsel, we recognize that collectively we are that body. We're all part of it. Take and eat. So he took the cup. We're familiar with all this, amen? He held it up, blessed it. He said, this is my blood. I'm sure they're kind of scratching their heads, which was shed for you. And again, it's a beautiful gesture. Scripture tells us that, that by that blood, we're forgiven, reconciled to God. But it doesn't stop there because... He was about to pour that blood out. The Jews believed that blood was life. Jesus was about to pour his life out for those who believe in him. A very noble gesture in itself, amen? But he rose. He rose three days later. The body that was broken now becomes this body, The blood that was shed, that life that was shed now becomes our life, imperishable life, 
based on eternity with our Father in heaven just because Jesus went to the cross for us. And when we, when we take this blood, we accept and reaffirm that life that pours into us. We say, yes, Father, thank you. And I look forward to that day when the expectation becomes a reality. Take a drink. Lord, we give you thanks. Lord, we give you praise. Lord, our hearts burst with joy over knowing who you are and how, how much you love us, Father, and how much you have given us, Lord. And we receive all of those things that you've given us, not just the, the awesome gifts of provision, Father, but the charge you've given us, Father, the job you've given us, the way you've knit our hearts together, the way you send us out, Father, the way you teach us to work together, to serve each other, to serve the people around us, Father, to be those ambassadors that you have called us to be. We give you thanks, and we give you praise. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be back next week with 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Pastor John back here again. If you are blessed by the service, let me ask you to do us a favor. Would you click on the like button below that little thumbs up? If you're listening on sermon audio, perhaps you can comment or even share the sermon with someone else. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter at WBFVA. We're on the World Wide Web at WBFVA.org. Let us know if you'd like us to pray for you. If you'd like to support us financially, you can make donations through our website at WBFVA.org. Just click on Giving. You'll receive a tax-deductible receipt at the end of the year. Either way, we would love to hear from you or even have you visit us in person one Sunday. We meet at 46 Winchester Street in downtown Warrington, Virginia at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning. And now, may God bless you richly until we gather again.